I would request Dr. Vidya Yerabdeka to kindly say a few words of welcome for Mr. BVR Subramaniam, former Commerce Secretary, Government of India. So, a uh, very good morning to all of you all and uh, we, uh, we see a lot of people still trickling in after a nice hot cup of tea or coffee. So, we are extremely thankful to you for having accepted our invitation and Mr. Subramaniam actually doesn't need any introduction. Uh, my own experience and interaction with him has been for several years. Uh, you know, he was at the highest office at the Prime Minister's office and then as the Chief Secretary of JNK and uh, just retired as a for Commerce Secretary and uh, but his views on education while he has held all these portfolios I think other than Secretary Education but I think he has very very strong and positive views on higher education. I've had this interaction with him on uh, several round tables and uh, one recent round table when he chaired uh, a discussion uh, organized by the Services Export Promotion Council on the board that I sit uh, and uh, you know on how and what would be exactly what we are talking about, how India can be a global destination for higher education. So, sir, we are extremely happy that you have accepted to come here. Your words of wisdom, uh, you know, will be something that each one of us will carry forward. And uh, the two days of this FIKI higher education conference, is, as you saw, uh, the program is really intense, uh, excellent speakers, and we will definitely create a paper and submit it to the government of India for further action. So, with these few words, sir, I welcome you for this special address. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, ma'am. And ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together to welcome our eminent keynote speaker, Mr. B.V.R. Subramaniam, former Commerce Secretary, Government of India. Over to you, sir, for your keynote address. Uh, Dr. Vidya, an old friend and chair of this session and uh, chair of FIKI's Higher Education Committee, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it's an honor to be with all of you and it's always humbling to be in front of educationists because, you know, our Indian tradition after father and mother, matru devo bhava, pitru devo bhava, then you acharya devo bhava, who we are is because it's totally because of our teachers and as a bureaucrat that's a lesson we often tend to forget because you know bureaucracy comes along with a chair you know uh, certain powers and privileges and then you forget that you were there because of somebody else and I think it's important to remember this throughout your life the second is we have a poem in Telugu which says you know Vitya Nigura Gupta Dhanamu Vittamu Purushalikin. You know, it's it's a hidden wealth. People who have Vidya, I'm not going to say the thing in Telugu, they are respected around the world. That is a wealth they carry with them everywhere. Vidya Rajya Pujitamu. Kings and monarchs, they actually honor people who have knowledge. So it's a lovely poem. I'll pass it on. It's it's it, every second word is vidya there. So it it's the only asset you carry away with you wherever you are, and it can never be stolen. Also, so I think that's what education is do. And I'm very happy that Fiki actually has a vertical on education, and it's trying to promote education, thought, and how can India be a leader in education. Uh, you're also organizing this at an opportune time. Uh, we have just come out of COVID. The last three years have not been so good. Children have been missing schools and colleges. And it's opened up new vistas, frontiers, online learning. But at the same time, the touch and feel of education is also missing from the day-to-day -day lives. You know, the, the social skills you pick up were missing. And I think it's good that you've come back. It's also good because we are India just become the head of G20. So, FIKI bodies like this can actually infiltrate government thinking on what can be done, not just within India, but globally. And G20 is what? 85% of the world's population, 90% of the world's GDP. So it is actually a good occasion by next December when our Honorable Prime Minister will be chairing the G20 in Delhi. I just want to tell you before I go ahead, what is India today? India has just become the world's fifth biggest economy. 
and God willing, in a couple of years, it will be the third biggest economy. It's got 1.4 billion people. I mean, what separates us and China is just a couple of million now. It's not even hundreds of millions. It's just a few million. And we're probably going to overtake China in a year or two. But that's not enough. Our Prime Minister has actually drawn up a vision and he's forcing bureaucrats, his colleagues and the public at large through consultation to develop a vision for 2047. I don't want to go through what the vision is going to look like because it's still a work in progress. Because the vision is not just a dream. A vision is being followed by an action plan. But what will India look like 25 years from now? And people in your field are particularly relevant a, because they form the foundation of that vision. Also, education is something which does not fructify overnight. I was direct, one of the sectors I actually loved to have been in, was in education. I would have loved to be education secretary. Government thought I was fit for something else. Maybe unfit for this. But I was director of public instruction. That's the old name in many states for director education in Madhya Pradesh for three years. And, you know, running... 80,000 schools, a cadre of 7 lakh teachers. What and One of the first things you learn is, unlike industry, unlike any other sector, doing something in education, the results come after 5 to 8 years. Because even if you want to improve primary education, by the time a child finishes class 5, it's going to be 5 years. So it just doesn't produce results overnight. And that's one of the reasons why bureaucrats are very bad at education. Because they don't have the patience. First of all, they don't last so long. And therefore, education requires a long-term thinking. And one good thing is, today you have a government which is actually thinking far into the future. You have a new education policy. People have agreements, disagreements. But the fact is you have a policy. The question is, we'll implement it all in our own ways. But I think that sets the benchmark. What is India going to look like in 2047? It's important to keep that at the back of our minds when we are trying to think of India as a hub for education globally. India is going to have roughly 1.6 billion people. 1.6. Our population is stabilizing. But look at our economy at that point. We are a $3 trillion economy today. The $3 trillion is going to become on a base case, not the best case. $30 trillion. $30 trillion is larger than the United States today. It's one and a half times. They're a $20 trillion economy. So you actually cannot imagine what a $30 trillion economy is going to be. None of us can actually imagine how many zeros are there and what it would mean for day-to-day -day life. A per capita income will be about $20,000 US dollars per year per capita. It's unimaginable what lifestyles will be, what will be our consumption pattern, what will be the demand for education and other services in the country. Take exports, because I have just Commerce Secretary. We have about $670 billion of exports this year. It would go up to about $8 trillion. $8 trillion. These are numbers which are, again, unbelievably large. And services in which education actually falls, we have about $250 billion of exports last year. And if somebody consumes education in India, it's treated as an export. It will go from $250 billion to something like $5 trillion, 20 times. Just see the kind of world that's going to open up out there. And all of you are going to be part of that big story. Education will be a big product which will be consumed in India by people around the world. It will be a major, major export. And I think this is something which is to be kept in mind when we think about the future. I've seen the sessions. I've just got the program. It covers a large number of areas. So I'm going to dwell on something else. I'm going to try to lay down what you need to be thinking about today and also in the future. India is a major power in services. It's apparent when you actually compare goods with services. If you look at our size of our economy globally, the size of our population, and our share of merchandise goods trade, it actually is less than what it should be. But in services, we actually punch far above our weight. We are a services power. We are in the top 10 in services. We are not there in trade, in goods. So I think that's something. Secondly, we are a surplus exporter in services. So in services, we export more than we consume. However, there's one problem. Services, as per the WTO, has about 16 subsectors, of which education is one. But out of the 16, we dominate in basically two, which is IT services and what they call other business services. That's all your BPO and, you know, 
R&D done in India, all that kind of stuff. So we exported $250 billion of services last year. $150 billion was IT-IT related. So that's almost 75%. That's the problem. We need to give attention to non-IT services. IT will grow whether or not we pay attention to it because it has achieved the critical mass. What we need is to focus on other services sectors. And among that, I see two very, very big low-hanging fruit. One is health services. India can become a global health hub. And the other is education services. India can be one of the major providers for education globally. It's not that Indians will not go abroad to study. We are one of the largest exporters of children going out to study. It will continue. We are already overtaking China in many countries also because of ge geopolitical reasons. We have become number one exporter of kids to the United Kingdom. We are very large in the USA. We are number two, but we are very soon going to become number one there. UK, USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, come where Indian children are going everywhere. But education is a two-way street. An equally large number and many more times and actually can come to India, should come to India, are already beginning to come to India. The reason is different. I'll compare it with automobile, something which people understand. India will be a major automobile manufacturer. India will also be a major consumer of high-end automobiles. A lot of these high-end automobiles will come from outside. So the Jaguars and the Mercedes and the BMWs will come from outside. Your Marutis and your Hyundais or whatever are made in India, your Mahindras, they'll go around the world. In sheer numbers, we will be large. So there will be a small segment which will consume education abroad. But what you provide in India, high quality education at a price point, which is required by large numbers of people globally, India is unmatched. It's unmatched. I mean, I'm telling you this because why I mentioned automobiles is just the last thing we were doing and it's high on the agenda is to conclude a free trade agreement with United Kingdom. And automobiles is a big thing. Can you believe it? We make three and a half million cars a year. They make 800,000, 8 lakhs, that's all. We make 35 lakhs. That's where we are in terms of size. And so, you know, my simple question is, how are they a threat? And you talk to Mr. Bhargav of Maruti, he said, my sade char lakh ki gaadi one and a half lakhs is taxes, three lakhs is the cost of the car. Tell me who in the UK can make a car at three lakhs and supply to India? Nobody. Be it two wheelers, be it without a component, I'll say, why not education? What we can provide in India in terms of high quality education at a price point which is unmatched is, I think, something which is our strength. And I think that's something which we should actually deliberate upon in government, outside government, in institution, to set up the right policy framework and take the right steps to make this realizable. What are your strengths? And that's something I will dwell on only for two, three minutes because then I want to go on to the challenges. The strengths are a few. I think the first strength is something which our IT sector has capitalized on, which is English language. Whether we like the English people or not, we should be thankful to them that they left behind the English language. And if at all you were to have been colonized, we should be grateful to God or history that we were colonized by the British and not by the French or the Portuguese or the Spanish. Because you actually are now speaking a language which is the dominant language globally. And I think that is your strength. Because English education, I mean, the French hate English culturally, but they have no choice but to learn English as a second language if they have to be a global citizens. So I think English is our one of our biggest strengths. And I think that's what a university and higher education system has to capitalize on. The other strength is our size. I mean, a billion and a half people. Where else in the world will you have capacities of this nature which can actually service our needs and international needs? The number of institutions we can have, the number of college professors we can have, it's unmatched. So I think size is important. You know, when we talk, again, I go back to trade. You talk to UK, one of the things we are discussing is uh, wines and whiskies. Okay, we make whiskey, they make whiskey, fine. We consume 220 million cases of whiskey, of which only 5 million is scotch. 215 million is Indian whiskey. Who can actually compete with that whiskey? Nobody can. So the point is we are big and size is important and that should give us confidence. The third strength we have, and I think that's very, very important, is diversity. 
in India you will find people of every color, every size, every language, every religion. It's unbelievable. So what happens is people from around the world will find their own niche in the country where they are comfortable with. I get a lot of tourists and I was Chief Secretary JNK for three years. I would get a lot of tourists from outside India, a lot of Western tourists who want skiing in Gulmarg, they come on a helicopter, jump on a hill and ski. It's adventurous stuff. But I get a lot of tourists from Malaysia and Indonesia. They feel very comfortable to go to a snow resort in Kashmir rather than a snow resort in Switzerland. It's a cultural issue. So India provides diversity. Every part of the world can find their own little island where they are comfortable with. You know, people come from Africa, they can be happy somewhere. Somebody comes from Southeast Asia, they can be happy somewhere. Somebody comes from Central Asia. And we have links everywhere. So I think that's the third strength, our diversity. The fourth thing is, our education system is also diverse. I mean, look at the number of school certification systems we have. We have CBSC, we have ICSC, we have the old A-level, O-level, which is I think IGCSC, you have the IB system. I mean, I don't know, and then you have so many state boards which are there, and to go with that, I don't know, in old times, my own state, there used to be something called Andhra Metric. Andhra University would conduct a matriculation exam, and then you went into college. One of my sisters did that. You didn't even go to a formal school. So what I mean is, the diversity in educational systems means we have a capacity to handle various educational system pass outs in our system. You get it? So if you take a college in India, you go to Delhi University, they will have students coming with so many backgrounds in terms of what they have studied in school. But they all go and merge. So our college system can handle this diversity. So I think that is a strength. And lastly, and I am saying this without any unnecessary modesty, we have world class institutions. Quality is our strength. Let's not be ashamed. I have heard people say in big forums that education is not good, only 10% of engineers are employable. I disagree. And I disagree vehemently because are you deciding for them or they are deciding for themselves? So what? You may think you don't want to send your kid to that university or college. But whose parents and that kid, when they send that person to that college, they are making a life decision. And mind you, I come from a state where you have an engineering college in Andhra and Telangana in every block. You may like it or not, they are making their decisions and they are successful, they are going around the world. And they are doing something for themselves. The government is not doing anything for them. Who are we to patronizingly say that this is bad education? I have seen big dons of industry say this. But let me tell you, it's so surprising. You go around, I mean I travel in buses, you know, to see how the real world is. Uh, there will be a state road transport corporation. I remember and behind that there was an advertisement, State Bank of India. If your son is an NRI, please open an account with us. This is in rural Andhra. I mean, look at the aspiration. And mind you, they may do this, they may do some education, go to a third rate college in, by public standards, go somewhere outside the country. Then they will do a second degree. After some time, they will grow. End of his life. They may become somebody big in their eyes, not your eyes. I think that's what is relevant. So these are very bad statements to say that, you know, we don't. Every college is fulfilling some felt need. And the market force is in operation. I mean, I, I, I know in Chhattisgarh, where I was the Home Secretary, 50% of engineering seats go vacant. Fine enough. People are making their decisions on this. There's a very active system by which people get feedback which colleges get you what and which colleges don't get you what. So just as you can provide education at different price points globally, you have colleges here which provide education to people at their own levels. Education is a great equalizer and I think it is playing a great equalizing role. And it is the looking down on private education in some parts of the country which is also a contributor to those states being laggards. The southern states and the western states which have invested heavily in private education didn't care for criticism about quality or donations or whatever have actually done better for their people. And I think that's something which now the rest of the country is realizing and I think it's time for government also to accept reality. There are challenges, I'm not denying that. Then I'll come to that in a minute. So I think these are the strengths we should leverage for India to become a global hub. But it's not easy to climb this mountain. Making this vision a reality actually is a bit of an effort. So I'll, I'll, I'll just state about a dozen challenges which you can think through during the day and later on also. Firstly, 
and this very important quality. I mean, we sold some medicines in Africa. It created a problem, but the problem is not those medicines and one company. It spoils the name of the country. Because people don't, so who remembers which pharma company made a medicine? They'll only know that they are India ka dawai, there seems to be a problem. So we need to correct that. The same thing applies in education. If you start producing low quality people who actually do not meet certain standards or uh, expectations, you actually spoil the name of India as a brand. So I think the system, both government as well as private, are a lot of self-regulation. I mean, Fikki could actually think of promoting an internal regulatory peer assessment system by which, why do you have to have a government that doing an assessment for you? You can do your own assessment and do that. After all, there are the college ranking and the college assessment systems and the accreditation system in the U.S. are not sanctioned by the U.S. government. They are all done by associations. It's, it's time to start thinking of that because it's good for the, uh, the, the ecosystem of higher education that we have our own high standards which are maintained. So I think quality is an important thing. The second thing is certain minimum uniformity in output in the sense that if I get a graduate in a country, I don't want every graduate to be termed as equal to an IIT or an IIM or All India Institute or whatever. But this is a basic skill level with which they, a product comes out of a college. I think that's something we need to work out. A uniform minimum level which everybody actually achieves at the end of whatever they study at higher education. I think that's important. I mean, when, 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 when these people in Bombay and Delhi or Chennai, they send somebody to say New Zealand to study or somewhere, nobody knows what those colleges are, Wellington, Christchurch, but you know that the product will meet certain minimum standards. I think it's important to establish those minimum uniform quality standards. The other is greater integration with global education systems. I think that's essential. Colleges tend to be far more diverse, unlike schools. But I think there is a greater integration. Just three months ago, four months ago, I think, I don't know, May, June, July, I can't remember, July, I think, we signed an agreement with the UK. And, you know, me and my counterpart signed, whereby the degrees in UK will be treated as equivalent to degrees in India. Okay, what you call mutual recognition agreements. What happens is it promotes two-way traffic. The British went back and said a lot of Indian students will come. A lot of our colleges went back and said a lot of British people will come and study in India. So be it. It's possible. I mean, after all, the High Commissioner in Delhi of the UK is actually somebody who spent four years in Indore teaching in Delhi College. So actually there is a lot of interest. And youth is a time when people want to explore frontiers. So actually you can actually have a lot of people from advanced countries coming and study to India. You need more of such agreements. So we need to integrate with global education systems. That, you know, splendid isolation is not a good thing. Whether we like it or not, be it trade, be it education, be it whatever. We are part of one world. The Prime Minister keeps saying Vasudeva Kutumbakam. We are one world. So we need to have education systems which are not identical but transferable. I think that's important. The other is, and this is an issue which actually bothers me and our country a lot, is tamper-proof and acceptable certification systems. Fraud is something which is affecting the education. You know, when a child wants to go somewhere, your college degrees in India are very, there are verification bodies now internationally which verify Indian degrees. This is fraud. I think it's important and if the government doesn't do it, you should do it. After all, it's a private body which is checking your certificate. Ask your kid to apply to Oxford, Cambridge, Stanford, wherever. They'll start checking your degrees. And they said, you pay another hundred dollars to get it done. Why can't we do it domestically? I think that's something to look at. Because I think fraud in education certification uh, system is something which is very important to focus on. And then the next issue which is very problematic, which is domestic needs versus global needs. What our markets, India needs, is quite different from what the world needs. There are a lot of commonalities but a lot of differences. I'll give you an example of the tea sector. We produced 250 million kilos of tea in 1947. We exported 200, drank 50. Today we produce 1400 million kilos of tea. We export 200, drink 1200. 
Our exports have remained the same since 1947 and 2022. We are drinking whatever we are producing. That is a big problem in India. Because we are so big, we are focused domestically, there is so much demand. We need to think globally and the problem is what we need domestically is different. I will give you an example on nursing. We want to have bilateral agreements on nursing. Other countries are not keen on signing a bilateral agreement recognizing your nurses. I Many of you may be having institutes which train nurses. The reason is hugely variable quality system. The nurse in Kerala, Karnataka is different from a nurse in Bihar, UP. This is no, 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 we won't. We'll say we are one nation, so one certificate, so we won't. But bilaterally, they are having agreements with state governments. Because within the state, the quality is uniform. I think this is something which is very, very important. I actually felt if you put very high standards, you will kill the sector in many states. Maybe you need two certification systems in India. One for the international market and one for the domestic market. It's high time to think about that. That you have a welder or an electrician, he has one certification if requirement if he wants to work in India. He has a higher certification system if he wants to work internationally. Let him or her pass that. It's very important. Otherwise, a lower domestic standard, which is a need, will pull down our acceptability globally. We may have to end up with two, and I am a clear votary. The country needs two certification systems. Otherwise, they will set up their own certification systems. So we actually need two certification systems in all fields. Otherwise, uh, the domestic will swamp international. The next is you have huge faculty constraints. That's something I think one of your sessions is going to, if you want to expand, we don't get enough PhDs, we don't get enough teachers. We have to make teaching as an attractive profession. The other is allowing corporate structures in education. You know, why don't we allow companies to be making, you know, uh, running education systems? Why do you have to be a trust or a society? You know, profit is considered a bad word. I think it's something ideological. We were just discussing that outside with uh, the chair of this session and others. It is not. Dhana moola midam jagat. End of the day, everybody has to make a living. Government may not be earning a profit out of education, but they are paying for it through taxes. So in a way, there is a cycle of money going on there also. So I think we need to think of allowing newer corporate structures for the education system. That's the only way it will expand. The other is... Embracing technology, it's very, and I think our, overall if you look at it, we have been slightly behind the curve. You go to Georgia Tech, they give a full line online master's course in engineering. In engineering, and not humanities or whatever. So I think it's time to think of that. You'll have to think of more online hybrid. I think COVID helped uh, push our thinkings and frontiers. Education will be delivered in multiple ways. I think it's saying time's up, I'll take two more minutes. The other is, we need to have more partnerships. I think, till your brands get established globally, you will need to think of more joint degrees, dual degrees, so that people can say, okay, I have one degree from India, one from some international thing, from INSEAD, uh, Paris, or wherever, so that actually it becomes more saleable, particularly in the initial years. Uh, you have a globally recognized degree, high quality but cheap education, I think it's a perfect marriage. The other issue is visas. After all, what did we negotiate with Australia? Indians who study in Australia will get a four-year work visa. I think the government has to start thinking about allowing students to come to India to have a one to two-year work visa. That is going to be a major, major plus point in actually being able to sell Indian education. People can come here, somebody will come, they will do say a computer science course in India, work in Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune and then go back. They actually become much more enriched. So you know, uh, they, some countries call it work visa, some call it holiday and work visa. So I think that's something that has to be pushed and that agenda has to be pushed if education has to become globally. The other issue is flexibility. You know, you're all constrained by UGC and then the way, I think the new education policy is pushing you in that direction. You know, that's where the government actually comes in. Uh, we have in commerce uh, organization called India Brand Equity Foundation. The Prime Minister on 15th of August talked about Make in India. But I think Make in India should be added with Serve from India. 
it could be said taught from India or you know studied in India or some such brand. It should be promoted not for an institution but to change a mental makeup. You know, it's a poor country. It can't provide high quality education. It's a country of snake charmers. Go to India to study yoga. Fine. But you know, not everybody is going to come to you to study yoga, right? Um, there only there's an X amount of demand. There's going to be a demand for far more fields where you can actually get employment. So I think it's important to have a branding of India as a high quality destination. So I would request that you have a lovely five sessions ahead of you. Focus on these thoughts. The future is big. 1.6 billion size country, a 30 trillion dollar economy will not happen without a solid higher education sector which is global, globally big, dominant. Out of the 500 universities, you should have at least 100 of them there. That should be a clear goal. 100 universities in the top 500 in the world and of which 80 should be private universities. That's the way forward. Thank you very much for being with you today. Wish you all the best. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for that insightful keynote address and for some of those very valuable inputs we had from you and ideas, especially something like dual certification and branding. Thank you once again, sir, for that keynote address. You may kindly take your seats in the front, sir. And now for the next presentation which is on Higher Education in India, Vision 2047. May I invite Dr. Avantika Tomo, Partner Education Practice, EY Pathano. Let's put our hands together to welcome ma'am. And ladies and gentlemen, the presentation will be immediately followed by a panel discussion session. So over to Dr. Avantika Tomo for her presentation. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Subramaniam, thank you for that address. I think between the inaugural session this morning and what Dr. Subramaniam just said, I feel my job is kind of done here because everything I wanted to say, everything I had planned uh, has already in a way been shared. So what I will do though, and I was talking to someone during the tea break, I will just emphasize a few points once again because many of us are educators here. So it might be helpful for us to keep repeating. That's what we do with our students. We keep repeating a few messages over and over again. And uh, eventually it lands. Eventually it has a point. Um, Ratija was giving me that idea, right? That just keep re-emphasizing, keep talking about the points that are really, really crucial for our um, higher education in India. With that, um, if I could just thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, can I just start by saying, um, dear guests of honor, all the delegates from industry, all the delegates from academia, uh, a lot of the delegates who are present here from uh, you know, a wide variety of government organizations, and then the attendees of this summit, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for attending. Thank you for letting us organize as Fiki and EY Parthenon together, letting us organize this session on higher education in India. This is about Vision 2047. Um, I think Ravi mentioned it earlier. 2047 is 25 years away. Uh, we've had 75 years already. We've had, we've made some great progress. We've done well when it comes to higher education in this country. We've got some fabulous higher education institutes, but we have a long way to go. Um, and what some of my colleagues and guest speakers before me have done, we have spoken about challenges. My plan though is to maybe um, help you realize how big some of those challenges are as well. Because as we set up for 2047, our goals are pretty massive. So let me be very clear, even in the report that was distributed earlier, as you flick through it, I know a lot of people um, started going through the report, people have been talking to me about, oh, there are some great ideas and there are some big goals. Yes, there are some very big goals, right? Um, these days they call it BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. So collectively, we, all of us together here in this room, have taken, taken almost a pledge to take India towards these BHAGs. So if there's one thing you can take away from my talk here, uh, remember, none of this is going to be easy. 
So I know we are all optimistic. We are passionate people. Um, thanks to Fiki, we have all these conversations every year. Um, let me be very, very, very honest with everyone here as we were writing the report as well. Uh, my team is here. As we were writing the report, we knew there were things that we were writing in that report that are going to be very, very difficult. So let me walk through what these targets are. Again, somewhere I can see Bridget in the audience as well, Australia. They are roughly around the 60-65% mark. We are at 27 today. Which means we need to go from 39 million to 87 million seats in higher education institutes. So what Mr. Subramaniam said that, you know, our quality is so bad, there are some colleges that don't do anything, perhaps, but there is room for all types of students. We have to create capacity at all levels. We've long had islands of excellence with our IITs and our IIMs. We now need to really cast a much wider net for those 87 million people. So if we are serious about our GER being 60%, we need to create capacity. Some other goals, again, um, NEP has already done a great job at making sure that investment is committed into education. So overall, we plan to have 6% of our country's GDP to be spent on education, both K-12 and higher education combined. On research and development, so R&D, again, I'm sure there are many educators, many researchers in the room today who are very proud of their research. Great, please be proud. Let me tell you a stat though. Combined US and China produce almost 50% of the research that the world does. We are less than 5%. So we are very proud and we should be proud of what we've done, but we do have a long way to go. Um, student cities, right? We you know, with, with the help of everyone in Fiki's Higher Education Committee, um, we have a goal, we have a vision that in 25 years we will have at least, at least being the keyword, 10 student cities. It's possible. I can see Ravi in the audience, Manipal, Coimbatore, Pune, Bangalore, there are a lot of these cities that already have the basics of what will be required for a student city. We just need to make sure that the infrastructure that is required, not just by domestic students, but also like everyone else before me has said, international students. We just need to create that infrastructure. Help 10 cities in India become student cities. Have our own Boston, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Um, international students, again, um, I won't spend too much time on it, but we do send 800,000 students over, overseas, we get only 50,000 in return. Our BHAG here is to have 10 times that number in 25 years. Again, can we do 10 times? Has anyone done, done 10 times? But I just feel 25 years is a long time. If collectively with all the brain power in this room here, if we can't commit to doing something that is 25 years away, I think something's wrong. Um, and then finally, in terms of our global reputation, so today, as per QS rankings, which I know a lot of us follow, uh, there are no Indian higher education institutes that are in the top 100 of QS. There are three, as per Times, higher education ranking. We, our BHAG there, is to have 30 to 40 higher education institutes from India that are globally recognized. And it's absolutely possible. We just need to make sure that, like someone said earlier as well, industry, academia, government, all three are coming together. Because any one piece missing from these three, and I don't think some of these targets and challenges will be met. Um, speaking of challenges, and again, um, you know, at the risk of being repetitive, um, there are both structural and implementation challenges as we think about the road ahead. It is going to be a difficult road, but as we think about it, there are some structural issues. Public spending. So on research, today we spend 0.7% of our GDP compared to, again, some of the developed world, some countries which are very good at research, who spend 2 to 2.5% of their GDP just on R&D. So we need to really, really rethink, and all the government entities present here, we need to rethink how to commit more to public spending in education. Um, student financing, today, you know, with the exception of, you know, some really good private institutes and IITs and IIMs and whatnot, um, 
student financing is anywhere in the range of 10 to 14 percent as interest rate. Globally, if you see countries that have been able to attract a lot of students to do pursue higher education, have it in single digits. 4%, 5%, 6% interest rate. We are almost in some cases triple of that. So how do we get our students, how do we get our young people to do uh, not just undergraduate degrees but postgraduate degrees? Um, private investment, again, complicated regulatory framework does make it difficult for investors. Quantity over quality, again, there is, I think, like Mr. Subramaniam said, there is room for both. But right now, we really need to make sure that our institutes are focusing on quality just as much as adding capacity. On the implementation side, um, reputation, internationalization, they go hand in hand. The better our reputation is, the better we do in rankings, the better we do in research, the more students come here, the more faculty from all over the world want to partner with us. Um, Insufficient in infrastructure, so again, I think there are still colleges in our, 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 our country that do not have the right, both physical and digital infrastructure. Um, faculty, again, most people have spoken about it. Faculty development programs are much needed. Uh, we do need to make sure that as we focus on reskilling, upskilling our students and giving them the right industry skill set, we are also doing the same for our faculty. And then finally, uh, digital literacy, digital awareness, making sure that we are powering some of this and we are, you know, almost underpinning the change that we are looking for through digital. Because again, we are not going to go from 39 million to 87 million by setting up physical colleges. It's just not going to happen. We need to rely on digital because that's where the scale, the reach, the access can be improved. So finally, uh, what does all of this mean? And you'll see this in the report, we've given a lot of detail around um, how to then set it up, right? I've, I've said 25 years, I think 25 times now, but how do we do this? And we've created five five-year plans under those themes that you see in those blue boxes. Student centricity, give students the flexibility uh, for which, again, the educators in the room, I think we will need to change our mi mindset. We will, unless we as educators are flexible, I don't think we'll be able to provide students the flexibility that they need. The second is research and innovation. We need to, again, if we want to become an international global destination, like the summit says, we will need to focus on research. We will need to focus on innovation. We need to invest in our faculty more and more and more. The more we do that, you know, there's something called satisfaction mirror. Happy faculty, knowledgeable faculty, skilled faculty will automatically mirror in the students. Um, international mobility and then finally digital learning. So those are the five kind of pillars that we have set up in the report. And what we've done is we've given very clear five five-year action plans. In the first five years, India as a country and higher education as a sector, both public and private together, should have achieved A, B, and C. That's how we've set up the report as well. Um, and then lastly, um, I know my time is up now, but lastly, you know, there is a vision, and I'm pretty sure everybody in this room will agree with me. As I say, we want to be equitable, inclusive, accessible when it comes to higher education. We all are here today and hopefully tomorrow because we want India to become the global destination for higher education. Let's make sure that collectively, it's not one person's job. Us as consultants, um, educators, um, academicians, industry, government, unless all of us are coming together, um, it's not going to be possible to get to that lofty vision. But thank you so much. I hope um, you do enjoy reading the report. If there's any questions, any thoughts you would want to add on it, me and my team are around. Please feel free to reach out. Um, uh, we are the team from EY Parthenon. Very, very, very happy to help you. Thank you so much.